In this video, I'm going to talk about validity and reliability. This video is designed to give a brief overview of the two concepts, so if you're looking for details that go beyond an introduction to the concepts, you're going to have to look elsewhere. So what are reliability and validity? Validity helps us to make meaning out of scores and research. Validity can help us to understand if a study can be applied to a specific population. For example, if I'm seeing a counseling client who is a 30-year-old female with depression, I might look at some research on how to treat depression. The research that I find may or may not be applicable to the client I'm seeing. And one type of validity, external validity, can help me make an informed choice about how to work with my client. There are a variety of types of validity. So in this video, I'm going to focus on validity as it relates to tests, assessments, and other instruments. These types of validity can help us understand how to interpret and make meaning from scores on a given instrument. Reliability is a factor that contributes to the validity of an instrument. Reliability basically gives us an estimation of how consistent scores on an instrument are across time. One commonly used demonstration of reliability and validity is archery. Hitting the target is validity. In our research, our target would be a construct that we are interested in operationally defining. The instrument that we use to measure the construct is our operational definition. And we want to make sure that our operational definition is hitting the target. That is, it is measuring whatever abstract construct we want to measure. Examples of constructs we might be interested in are student's level of motivation, a counseling client's level of anxiety or depression, what type of personality someone has, or how well a person has mastered geometry. So if we are measuring what we think we are measuring, then we are hitting the target. But we might get slightly different measurements if we give a test multiple times, even if we give it to the same person over and over again. The average of these different scores gives us an estimation of the person's true score on the instrument. But what if we administer a test five times, and three out of those times we hit the bullseye? but two of the times were towards the outside of the target. Well, in that situation, we would want to look at the reliability of the instrument or how closely the arrows are clustered. This might seem a bit confusing and abstract right now, so let's look at some strategies for establishing validity and reliability. Keep in mind that both validity and reliability are sample and setting specific. That is, just because an instrument has been demonstrated to have validity and to be reliable with a specific group of people at a specific time in a specific location, that doesn't mean that it will still be as valid and as reliable with a different sample of people in a different location at a different time. So if you ever find yourself using instruments in your counseling or teaching, Consider estimating validity and reliability for each sample upon which the instrument is administered. Let's look at the different types of validity. The first type of validity is evidence based on test content. This type of validity cannot be measured or quantified. Rather, it is based on a rational examination of an instrument. This type of validity includes what is commonly called face validity. Face validity just means that if you were to read through an instrument, you would think that it was measuring what it was attempting to measure. For example, say I'm developing an instrument to help me diagnose generalized anxiety disorder using criteria from the DSM-5. If you read through my instrument, you'd probably expect to find questions that ask about worry and anxiety. If you were reading through it and you found questions asking about whether or not someone is an introvert or an extrovert, and didn't really find any questions about anxiety, you would probably conclude that my instrument has low face validity. This isn't always a problem, because I might want to design my instrument so that it can diagnose generalized anxiety disorder while ruling out alternative explanations for a client's symptoms. Thus, you might see questions about all types of different diagnoses, which could lead you to think that I'm not just measuring generalized anxiety disorder. So it's important to really understand what an instrument is trying to assess or, in other words, what the instrument is operationally defining while considering face validity. A second type of validity is criterion validity. This type of validity is established by correlating scores on the instrument for which you are trying to establish validity with some external criteria. These criteria can either be concurrent or predictive. 
Concurrent criteria are criteria that can be examined at the same time a subject takes a test. Examples might be existing tests that are trying to operationally define the same construct. Predictive validity looks at how well scores on an instrument correlate with future performance on some criteria. This criteria could be grade point average at the end of a semester for an instrument that's trying to predict academic performance. A third type of validity that is similar to criterion validity is construct-related validity. There are two types of construct-related validity, convergent validity and discriminant validity. Convergent validity looks at the extent to which scores on an instrument converge or correlate with another instrument. For example, if I compare the hypothetical instrument I developed to diagnose generalized anxiety disorder with an existing well-established instrument that can diagnose generalized anxiety disorder, a subject's scores on the two instruments should have a correlation coefficient that's relatively close to one. In other words, the scores on the two instruments should be closely related, or they should converge. I could further validate my hypothetical instrument for diagnosing generalized anxiety disorder by establishing discriminant validity. I could do this by finding instruments that are designed to assess other types of anxieties and phobias, and I could correlate subject scores on my instrument and the instruments that are measuring different things than I'm interested in. If there's a low correlation coefficient, then I have established discriminant validity. In other words, my instrument can discriminate generalized anxiety from other types of anxieties and phobias. Discriminant validity is basically defining a concept by discussing what it is not. For example, generalized anxiety is not social anxiety disorder or agoraphobia. So what if you want to generalize your findings regarding the validity of an instrument? Recall that validity is considered to be specific to the context in which it was established. For example, if I designed an instrument to test the extent to which you understand the various types of validity that I've talked about in this video, hopefully you would do pretty well. However, if another student learned about validity using a different video or statistics textbook, I might find the book they used had different terms for the different types of validity, since statistics textbooks often use different words to describe the same concept. The other student might not do as well on my instrument and thus, the validity would be different between you and the other student, and my test would be measuring how or from whom you learned about validity rather than what you actually know about it. Now that we have explored a few types of validity that are relevant in developing an instrument, let's look at reliability. Like I said earlier, reliability looks at how consistent an instrument is with a given sample of people. Variations in test scores can be categorized as either random errors or systematic errors. Systematic errors indicate there's a problem with the validity of an instrument, while random errors are unrelated to validity. Examples of random errors are changes in an individual, such as mood and energy levels, that could change between testings. There could also be differences in how the instrument is administered. For example, the building that subjects are taking a test in could be freezing during one administration and quite comfortable during another. The instrument itself could also impact reliability. For example, if I'm testing the reliability of my hypothetical assessment to diagnose generalized anxiety disorder, I might find that the instrument is not reliable if I haven't done a thorough job operationally defining generalized anxiety. If I only assess half of the diagnostic criteria for generalized anxiety disorder, I might miss a lot of people who should be diagnosed. Thus, my instrument would not be able to reliably diagnose everyone with generalized anxiety disorder, but it might be reliable at diagnosing subjects with certain features of the disorder. There are several ways to establish the reliability of an instrument, the first of which is to calculate a reliability coefficient. This can be calculated by giving the same group of people a test multiple times and correlating their scores across time. This correlation coefficient is also called a coefficient of stability. This method assumes that any changes in scores across time is a result of random rather than systematic error. One limitation of this approach is that it assumes that subjects won't score higher based on having practiced the test. Thus, this method is rarely used in education. 
as it is possible that subjects will learn the material during the first testing and will thus score better during the second testing as a result of having been exposed to the material. Another way to calculate a reliability coefficient is to split an instrument into two equal halves and administer both halves to the same subject in quick succession. The scores on the two halves are then correlated. This can help one to understand the extent to which an individual's scores depend on specific questions. Determining what constitutes an equal half can be pretty complex, so we won't get into it in this video. There are a number of different ways to calculate the correlation coefficient for split half reliability, including the Cooter Richardson 20 and 21 formulas, also known as the KR20 and KR21, as well as calculating Kronbach's alpha. We won't have time in this video to look at the formulas used to make the calculations, but they are relatively simple and are widely available. The final type of reliability that we'll look at in this video is called inter rater reliability. This type of reliability looks at how all scores that were determined by different people, or raters, correlate. This type of reliability is important when we're trying to measure something through observations. For example, a lot of research has been done recently on psychotherapy outcomes. These studies are basically trying to see what type of treatment is most effective for a given diagnosis. So if we want to test how effective cognitive behavioral therapy is for treating depression, we would want to make sure that the counselors in our study are actually using cognitive behavioral therapy. Thus, we might round up a few independent raters to observe the counselors and rate them on how well they adhere to the cognitive behavioral therapy model. Inner rater reliability would tell us how much agreement existed between the raters. Inner rater reliability can often be improved with training. There are a few things to keep in mind when interpreting reliability. First, the length of the test impacts reliability. Longer tests are typically more representative of the construct that they seek to operationally define and thus tend to have higher reliability scores. Also, the amount of diversity in subjects whose scores were used to calculate reliability can impact reliability estimates. Since most of the formulas used to calculate reliability use variance, or the amount of variability in scores between halves or testings, depending on which type of reliability you're calculating, higher levels of variance will result in higher reliability estimates. This is because the test has to be less sensitive, since there is already a lot of variance in the scores. It is also important to keep in mind that some variables are not reliable across time. For example, if I want to design an instrument to diagnose medication-induced sleep disorder, I might find the scores on my instrument change a lot across time as subjects change what medications they're taking. Hopefully this has given you a basic understanding of validity and reliability, particularly as they relate to instrument development. There are a lot of resources that go into more depth with these topics, so I would encourage anyone who is interested or needs additional information to read about these concepts in depth.